go ahead and get started so we can take advantage of all the time we have today with Richie. Uh, so good morning, and I'm Trish Seal, Associate University Librarian here at U of A, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our keynote and workshop later this afternoon. The future is open, the desirable and inevitable shift towards open educational practices with Dr. Rajiv Junkiani. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, I was going for really good, but that's okay. It's an A minus. Um, a minus. A yeah, yeah. A minus. Okay. Um, so, uh, really pleased that you're all here today. We're very excited to have Rajiv here to talk with us. <coughs> and also, just before getting started, I want to acknowledge the traditional territory on which U of A is located and acknowledge and thank the diverse First Peoples whose footsteps have marked and cared for this territory for centuries the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Metis, and Nakota Sioux. And also just want to acknowledge a few other logistical details before we get started, because I know many of you are from here, some of you are from campus, but maybe you haven't been here, and others of you are visiting us. Um, so just a couple of things, washrooms out the door, first door on your right, and then around the corner to your left. Um, we encourage you to tweet today, we've got a hashtag, UA Open Ed. Um, Rajiv's already said he's ready and prepared to be peppered with questions following the sessions today. <laughs> Um, so do feel free to tweet, use that as your hashtag. Um, we'll also, you probably already noticed, our colleague Angie is taking photos today. If you have any concerns about photos, please identify yourself to us, and then we can just, you know, know that as we proceed. But Angie's on our social media, so we thought it would be great to just be able to share some of our session more broadly than this room. And also just a detail around a s attendance list is circulating, if you can just check off if you're on that list. If you didn't register and you're here, we're thrilled you are. Uh, we'd like to be able to touch base with you later in the week just to get feedback on our events this week because this is the second of three. Um, and then finally, I'll just introduce Rajiv and pass it on to him. Uh, he, Rajiv teaches psychology at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Vancouver, BC, where he conducts research on open education and the scholarship of teaching and learning. He's the author of two open textbooks. He serves as an OER research fellow with the Open Education Group. He's also the recipient of a range of teaching and curriculum development awards, and he's been doing a lot of traveling recently, serving as a keynote at various events and conferences, and is a very engaging speaker from all Thank we've you. heard and seen. So we're very Thank pleased you. to have him here, and I'll just turn the floor over <coughs> to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, you know, thank you all for coming. I, mean, I know this is not a topic that's necessarily something that everyone has a lot of familiarity with, uh, but it's something that, oddly enough, Canada is gaining quite a bit of reputation for leadership for open education within Canada, BC, and I'm very happy to say within BC, my institution. Uh, and so I'd like to talk today not just about resources, because that's an easy way to start the conversation, is to talk about uh, the materials that we use for teaching and learning and therefore open educational resources. But I'd like to talk much more as well about the practices and how we engage with these materials as instructors, how our students engage with these materials and what it means for us as faculty, for students, for institutions, but ultimately for our communities as well. But before I begin, I, I actually want to acknowledge something else uh, and I want to wish everybody a very, very happy International Women's Day. Um, as a, a Yeah. I mean, as a, 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 you know, I think as a very, very proud uh, feminist, I'm, it's important to me to, to celebrate this day because, I mean, a, as our Prime Minister said recently, because it's 2016, uh, I'm remixing his, uh, revising his statement of course, updating it. Uh, but it is, uh, it is unfortunate that, it is a, that we still have a need to celebrate International Women's Day and that sexism and misogyny is still so rife. Anyway, I'll get off that soapbox and get on to another one. Um, so. I actually want to start by putting everybody on the same page with some common ground, with an experience that I think, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of us can relate to, even if we see it dire directly in the classroom or indirectly as we hear about it through students' experiences. So let me set the stage. It's a dark night. <laughs> Student knocks on a door of a faculty member's office. And he asks a perfectly reasonable question. Please nod if this question looks familiar to you. <laughs> perfectly rational argument is made. 
He says, they appear to be identical in content, but I can get the fourth edition from another student. And you have to love the depiction of the faculty member. <laughs> and then, of course, <laughs> but it gets better. He says, oh, wait, I'll just go download it illegally. Oh. And the faculty member says, but that's unethical. And it's interesting to talk about ethics in this context, because I think we're all familiar with the traditional practice of cosmetic additions uh, with minimal changes every couple of years and the frustration that can cause students. So I want to start with this, actually, because I, I think too many people are unfamiliar with the, with the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And within it, there's interesting enough language concerning the importance of accessibility of higher education. Uh, now, of course, this has to do with access altogether, but I would argue this applies as well uh, to course materials and the resources that we use for teaching and learning. Looks like there's a couple of people waving. Why don't you come in? As I said, access is important. So, <laughs> so this is interesting because I think this is a strong statement, but in my view, more and more, even though higher education is meant to be a, a vehicle I think that delivers us from social inequality. It's too often structured in a way that serves to reinforce it. And that's true with educational materials as well. So I don't think we often realize how many of our students require a student loan just to meet us in the classroom. <laughs> Canada-wide, we're talking about 50% of our undergraduate students need a student loan just to come to the classroom. And I'm glad that you recognize that film. So six years ago, federal student loan debt in this country exceeded $15 billion. And that was important because that was the debt ceiling for, for student loan debt. That's when the federal government raised the, the debt ceiling to $19 billion, and that ceiling is forecasted to be breached by the year 2020. Right? So that's a snapshot from about two weeks ago of the updated student loan debt, and that's just federal. Federal, federal debt's about 60% of government debt, and that excludes non-government debt as well. It's quite a serious issue. When you boil this down to the average student, we're talking about almost $29,000. This is the average student in this country. Of course, it varies quite a bit by program. And this is what I mean by why I don't think we fully are aware of the implications of this or how widespread this is. As faculty, we see it a little bit. We see it in those emails we get from students at the start of the semester. Right? Do you really need the textbook? Is a previous edition acceptable? We see those students who don't purchase the textbook. We see it, but we don't really see it. And I don't think we're aware of how widespread this is. Right? That's a lot of debt. And three years after having graduated, barely a third of our students have managed to free themselves from the shackles of this debt. I love that picture on the left because a few years ago, UBC had a marketing campaign designed to celebrate their graduates around convocation. And so they placed these posters all over the campus on the ground and they gave students these markers and asked them to fill in your most memorable experience. And as you can see, this one was filled in by an uncomfortably honest student. I will always remember UBC for my crippling debt. <laughs> Ouch. Right. And it's not the same. It's not the same as when many of us were students. Students are working a lot more while trying to go to school full time. Many of them are going to work full time while trying to go to school full time. Alberta is a case in point. There's no province in the country that has seen a greater increase in the number of hours that students are working while going to school. It's no longer the case that a student can take a summer job and have it pay for tuition and materials for the year. That's why we've got so many students working throughout the year. And I think that has implications for many things. But again, debt, right? We know that when student debt goes from $1,000 to $10,000, program completion rates plummet from 59% to 8%. And this is where institutions and administrators get especially interested, because it doesn't matter what your political preference is. Whether you're interested in this for a social justice argument, for which there's a very strong case, or whether you're simply interested in efficiency and allowing students to enter industry without this kind of shackle. Either way, there's a strong, strong case for moving to open education. And of course, when we talk about student debt, a lot of this is tuition, which I think is outside of the control of any individual in this room, um, or for that matter, cost of living, or the price of oil, but all of that together. But it's against the backdrop of all of that that it's worth mentioning that the cost of textbooks has gone up by more than 1,000% since 1977. The other line over here, that's the pace of inflation. So more than three times the pace of inflation. 
And in case you think this is some historical artifact, it's not. Even if you just look at the last 10 years, from 2006 to today, textbooks have gone up on, by average of 73%. And that's four times the pace of inflation. It's not the same at all. So there's a number of issues with this, but I'm, so, I'm sorry to say that we now live in the era of the $400 textbook. And this is not an isolated example. I wish it were. And if you're not familiar with textbooks that cost this much, then I suggest you do what most young people do now, and that's get on Twitter and follow Kanye West. <laughs> this is an interesting one. I was at a meeting recently with a bunch of open ed leaders, and in the middle of this conference, somebody said, hey, did you see that tweet by Kanye? And I confess, I don't follow Kanye on Twitter. Um, <laughs> But this one struck me as quite interesting. So it started with a bit of a story saying that he has a friend who works really hard, makes about $370 a day, and that her son just got into a really good school. Textbooks are like $400 each. <laughs> All right. And it finished with this epic tweet, we have to lower the price of textbooks. I was at a meeting with 130 open ed advocates, creators, distributors and our reach could never be as big as that <laughs> 140 characters that went viral instantly but so again this cost thing is, is quite real students are very aware of it uh, there are programs across the country student unions across the country have organized themselves so if you are on Twitter you should look for this hashtag textbook broke right? at the start of every semester now Students are going into bookstores, buying their books for the semester, taking photographs of their receipts, and tweeting these pictures to show people across the world how much they're spending on their textbooks. Okay. On the left, you're seeing another initiative where a student union group, another one, put this whiteboard outside the bookstore. Same idea. Students come out, and as they come out, they check off how much they've spent on textbooks for that single semester, ranging from less than 100 to more than 1,000. You can see several students over here have simply wrote in too much and sort of added a, a check mark there. My personal favorite, a little hard to see, all the way at the bottom, my firstborn. <laughs> That's how much I spent on textbooks. Now, of course, over here, your student union has also organized itself, and I'm sure you're aware of this Be Book Smart campaign, where they're suggesting a number of different ways that students can work around this issue. Ask your instructors about old editions, they say. Look online for free textbooks. But there's, of course, a lot more that needs to be done and can be done. And again, you know, Marketing campaigns like this are, are funny and amusing and allow us to, to uh, relate to students a bit more. But here's what's not funny either. This is happening right across the country. And the use of food banks and reliance on food banks by students across, across the country, and including at campuses like this one, has been increasing rapidly. And it's not students who are just first generation students, students at community colleges, students with traditional barriers to accessing tertiary education. It's everywhere. UBC saw a 100% increase in their food bank last year as well. This is a serious and growing issue. This is why open education is a social justice issue. Right? And then, of course, as instructors, completely unaware, we come into our classes and say, here's my syllabus, and here are the textbooks that are required. Right? And of course, students are clever. They're bright, and they find all sorts of interesting ways to get around it. And you're familiar with many of these, I'm sure. Right? Most bookstores have used, it, used book sales or used book buybacks as well. And students will do that. They'll buy used, if possible, if the edition hasn't changed just before the semester began, so then they're forced to buy the new book, or if the instructor's not committed to using some online platform that only comes with the new book, and so they can't buy the used book. Right? These ditches. They buy online, Amazon, let's say. They resell again, if possible, because midstream during the semester, new edition comes out. Their $200 textbook is now worth $15. It's incredible. Very, very expensive monitor stands is what these books make now. Many bookstores have rental programs, but students are increasingly purchasing textbooks uh, in groups, shared. Last year at the Open Textbook Summit in Vancouver, there were students from this institution that came to me and were describing what they were doing. They'd organized themselves in a group and bought the textbook for their course in a group of three or four. Of course, all of them need the book at the same time. This is very suboptimal. Libraries increasingly, including over here, are trying, trying to provide more options in the course reserves. But this is not a great option either. It's a stopgap measure. Right? We've all been photocopying. I photocopied books when I was an undergraduate. And students increasingly realize that they can buy international editions, uh, which are similar, 
probably 70% similar overlap in content. Uh, and they know that they're responsible for the mismatch in content with international editions or even with older editions. But often, it's a trade-off, right? And they're willing to make that decision. If 10% of their grade comes from the online quizzing that comes with the new textbook, they might go with the older edition. If 40% of their grade comes from the online quizzing, they might feel forced to spend the money. And these are the decisions that we make as instructors, as faculty, I think, thinking about pedagogy, but not really thinking through the implications for most of our students. Right? And sometimes you can't really argue with them when they want to buy a previous edition. How can you argue with that, really? And again, I said, we're all familiar with the practice of you know, new editions with merely cosmetic changes. Right? And we can make it better or we can make it worse. This is one of the ways in which faculty make it worse. There's nothing more frustrating for a student, I think, than spending a lot of money on a textbook and then realizing three months in that you only really needed three chapters from it. Right? Very, very frustrating. And this is precisely why students venture to this particularly dark corner of the internet <laughs> called RateMyProfessor.com. Right? And they look at many things at RateMyProf.com, but one of the things they look for, there's a specific tag for this, is uses the textbook. Right? And they're selectively registering in sections when there are multiple sections offered by multiple instructors. They're selectively registering in sections where you either don't need the textbook or the instructor actually uses the textbook. We're seeing this. By the way, I didn't make this up. This is a real profile that somebody made for Yoda, which I think is excellent. Um, and as should be fairly straightforward, he's very helpful but not very clear, um, <laughs> which I think makes sense. And then, of course, more than this, because students in increasing numbers are illegally downloading their textbooks using sites like Torrent. Right? Imagine the system is set up so that this is a preferable option. Right? Breaking the law, risking prosecution is preferable to students than buying a textbook. And I love this one because this is in the US, but I love the message. This is a message to Penn State, where the student studies, uh, from the student who actually scanned and uploaded the digital copy of the textbook. He says, Penn State, you are gouging your students. We'd be willing to pay a fair price for this book, but that'd be far south of the $200 you charge at the bookstore. Fix this, lower the tuition. Maybe students like me won't spend several days scanning your uh, materials and putting it online. <laughs> Also clean the bathrooms on the first floor. <laughs> it's like all the complaints are coming out. But yeah, and you have to love this, right? But this is happening increasingly. And it's strange to me because we are living in a time where we have un unparalleled access to information. A student with a smartphone and access to the internet, as long as they know where to look, they can find every bit of information that's contained within my Introduction to Psychology textbook. There's nothing proprietary about the information in the textbook at all. And it seems bewildering that we're still talking about editions. Editions. That we're waiting three years for a publisher review cycle, right? Which is designed to stamp out the used book market. Which is not designed to provide recent breaking developments and updates within the field as soon as they actually break. Why we're still talking about editions is beyond me, right? These things should be living, living documents. And here's what's worse. It's not just about the cost of materials, because then instructors will tell me, oh, well, students should value it. And if they spend the money, they'll value it. And it's not that big of a deal. This is a problem. We know that there's a direct relationship between textbook costs and student success. Right? These are data from a, a representative survey of students in the United States. But recently, we concluded a survey of BC students. And despite the differences across the context, we're finding very similar numbers. I hope to publish that in a couple of months. Uh, but we know that more than 60% of our students do not purchase textbooks for at least one of their undergraduate courses, much more likely to be an elective course, which is not great for curiosity-based learning. We know that 35% take fewer courses because of textbook course, costs. And we know that 23% routinely go without textbooks. Right? This is a social justice problem with a human face, and it's one that I see. So this is worrying, and this is where institutions get hurt as well. And again, let's talk about faculty. Because so far, I think I've suggested uh, on at least a, in at least a couple of um, places that faculty are making these decisions without really being fully aware of the implications on students. And I think to some degree that's true, but I also have great sympathy for faculty. No surprise, I am faculty. But I think it's important to, to portray the life of faculty accurately. And that's pretty accurate. Right? You're trying to keep on top of uh, heavy teaching loads increasing amounts of work that are being downloaded to your department. 
You're trying to serve your department, you're trying to serve your institution, you're trying to serve your discipline, you're trying to serve your community, right? Do some research, fulfill those scholarship obligations, and God forbid, spend a couple of hours every week with your family before you collapse in an exhausted pile. And it's in this sort of life that you get these wonderful smiling faces knocking on your doors every couple of weeks, unsolicited of course, and they send you gifts, and they send you these little brown packages, right? And these are our lovely publisher representatives. And they say, you know what, you don't have to worry, we get your pain. We've got this brand, brand new, shiny, beautiful textbook. It's updated, it's written, it's vetted, and you can trust it. And it comes with all of the PowerPoint slides that you need, so you never have to spend a minute developing those PowerPoint slides. I'm going to take an aside over there, because if you've ever looked at publisher-supplied PowerPoint slides, I have no idea why they actually market these. They're so <laughs> poorly designed. Um, but apparently they're a selling feature. But what's a much bigger selling feature are the test banks. Right? You don't have to even write another question for the rest of your life. We're going to give you this wonderful thousand question question bank. And you can pull out questions for all of your exams. You know, we know you're busy. We won't make it difficult for you to find the readings. We won't make it difficult for you to create your lectures. We won't make it difficult for you to write your questions or design your assessments. It's easy, they say. And then, of course, they've got all of the other gateway drugs, the online adaptive learning platforms. That's what faculty really get hooked on, are those sorts of ancillary resources. Right? And they think, oh, this is wonderful. And then they make these interesting claims about, oh, these platforms are brilliant. They've got great efficacy for learning. No data to support those claims, by the way. There's a recent study in, in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Journal uh, that actually document no tangible benefit to student learning from the use of these assessments, which is quite interesting. That's just one study. But the point is, we never ask the question about efficacy when we're introduced to these resources by publisher reps. And so, again, they come in, they promise to make our lives easier, and all we have to do is adopt the book, perhaps for the next three years if it's a, if it's a department decision. And I'm going to suggest this creates what's called a principal-agent dilemma. This is when an individual makes a decision that a larger group is governed by, but the individual making, a decision, making the decision does not have to face the consequences of that decision. Right? And a good symptom that we're dealing with the principal agent dilemma, I think, is if a faculty member is asked about the specific cost of a textbook that they've assigned for that semester. And if they don't know the specific cost, that's probably a good sign that you've a little too far removed from the implications of that cost. But if you do have these conversations with your publisher reps, right, many of whom are nice people, wonderful people, of course, They'll say, oh, no, it's OK. We're interested in, in helping students as well. So we've got the soft cover version. We've got the loose leaf binder version. And we've got the e-books. Right? The, this is what they'll come back with. And here's a, a good example. This is a, a textbook that I would have adopted several years ago. And the hardcover for this particular psychology textbook uh, is $190, or at least was back then, uh, plus tax and shipping and all of that fun stuff. And then they say, oh, no, but you can buy an e-book. You can assign an e-book, and students can buy that at the low, low cost of $102. Wonderful. Right? But I'm going to suggest that this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> and let me tell you why. Number one, it's leasing a book. It's not owning a book, which means that the license expires. Typically, after 180 days is the going rate. So if a student, you know, let's say, has to retake a course, fails the course, they have to buy the book again. If the student is interested in lifelong learning, what we keep talking about, too bad. You lose access to the book. I'm talking about affordability on the one hand, but let's talk about accessibility as well. Most of these platforms are locked with digital rights management, and they are incompatible with assistive learning technologies. If students can cannot afford instructional materials, required course materials, I think we have to ask ourselves, who higher education is reserved for. And if students who need assistive learning technologies cannot access the required course materials, who are we saying higher ed is reserved for? These are important questions. And beyond the lease that expires and beyond the problems with, with accessibility, of course, you even have things like restrictions. Students can't print it, for example, and they can't use it across all devices, specific apps, specific devices. It's difficult. A lot of people talk about students as digital natives, and that's talk that I hate. It's a ridiculous talk. Uh, and I don't know how many of your students or students you interact with are this way, but most of my students are not especially digitally literate. I'm far more literate than they are. There's a lot of literacy, a lot of training, a lot of scaffolding that's required. And I think we have to be careful about banding about language like that. But the other issue, of course, is if a student does buy this book, or I, sh I should back up, lease this book for $102 for 
180 days. That's it, poof. So oddly enough, a student who bought the $200 textbook and resold it at the, at the end of the semester would actually end up spending less money than a student who leases a book for 180 days and cannot recover any of that cost. Hence, wolf in sheep's clothing. So anyway, I don't think this is especially innovation. And I'm not even talking about the nefarious practices that I see weekly between faculty and departments and publishing companies. Right? This happens a lot. This happens quite a lot. Now, it may be because the Republican primaries are on right now that this is my sort of vision of what publisher meetings look like. But these are the sorts of deals that are struck. Hey, is there a student research event that we could sponsor? Is there an articulation meeting we could sponsor? Is there a conference we could sponsor? Adopt our book for the next three years and we'll be happy to support you. This happens routinely. And then, of course, if faculty start to feel uncomfortable with this and they express those concerns, the publishers will say things like, oh, it's OK. It's OK. You don't have to take the money. We will put the money into a scholarship fund for students, which on the surface looks better, but I'm going to suggest it's much more insidious. Because this is like a fixing a thousand leeches on the student body and then taking one of that, one of those, and donating it to one of the victims. It's really quite sad. And it's worse. I've worked in departments where the department gets a dollar value, kickback, two, three dollars, for every textbook that a student buys over the next three-year adoption cycle with us. It's incredible. I think if students knew about these practices, we'd see cars burning in the parking lot, quite frankly. I don't think this is ethical. But of course, there's a much better way to do things. And I'm going to suggest that way, at least one of the major ways of doing things better, uh, is called open educational resources. So take a look. So as you can see, that video was produced by OpenStax College, which is one of the many providers of open textbooks. They're based at Rice University in Houston. Um, I don't have any relationship or affiliation with them at all. I just really like that video. Um, but they're fantastic, and they've really gone quite far. OpenStax is funded by the Hewlett Foundation, among other groups. Uh, and their goal, again, is to produce open textbooks, which are open educational resources for the highest enrolled undergraduate courses um, in the States, which are certainly no different than what they are in Canada. So, but what we're talking about is open educational resources. So open textbooks are one type, one category of OER, but they're certainly not the only uh, kind. What's interesting about open educational resources is that most people focus on the fact that they are free, and they are free. But that's not what makes them an open ed resource. What makes them an open ed resource is that they come with a set of permissions. And that's what makes them interesting. Right? Um, and these are the permissions. They're typically described as the five R's. So the most obvious one is the one in the middle, the ability to reuse the materials as an instructor, as a student, for example. And again, for students, they can retain these materials forever. You can redistribute them to your students. Your students can redistribute them to their family, friends. Doesn't matter. Nobody's violating copyright at all. This is a permission that's built in. But as a faculty member, from my perspective, the really exciting permissions are the two R's at the, at the bottom. And these are the permissions to revise, to remix, to adapt, to contextualize the resources to suit your specific teaching and learning context. 
Right? I've been a part of committee adoption decisions for textbooks at three different institutions, and it usually works the same way. Right? And this is the case if it's not the individual faculty member choosing. If it's a committee, you start with all the books possible, like 12 books, 15 books, depending on the, on the topic, and you shortlist maybe half a dozen, right? six or so. And then when everybody's done sort of blackballing the one that they absolutely passionately hate, you end up with a book that everyone can sort of live with. It's certainly not the unquestionably best resource in the discipline. It's a book that everyone's like, yeah, I can live with that. And that's what we're living with. A book that has drawbacks, that has flaws, that has, is written by an author who has expertise in one area that's sort of reaching for other areas. And you think, oh, there are sections that are missing, add those in. There are sections that are outdated, revise those, update those. There are sections uh, that are simply wrong, take those out. Or if there are chapters you're not going to assign, take those out. In other words, the ability to customize and adapt the resource to suit your particular classroom. Right? And you can in even involve your students in this exercise. Students as creators, course assignments being the contextualization of the course resources, meaningful work for future generations of students. It's extraordinary. And to me, it's especially extraordinary because I think current practice is, for the majority of instructors, bending their courses to map onto the structure of a textbook instead of doing what I think we should be doing, which is dip, you know, adapting the course materials to serve our pedagogical and teaching goals. We do it the other way around. There are lots of these OER. Typically, they carry a Creative Commons or CC license. And I know many of you would have participated or, or experienced Cable Green's webinar yesterday. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about Creative Commons licenses right now, at least. But there are over a billion of these objects in the world. And these include, of course, uh, things like this. So if you're a student of art history, for example, you'll know that art history textbooks tend to be among the most expensive, simply because of the permissions involved. Uh, but the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands now provide extraordinarily high quality, high resolution images of masterpieces, free, public domain. It's incredible, right? You could print a poster the size of this whole wall, and you'd be paying for the cost of printing. No royalty, no cost for the actual image itself. They've given it away. This is an open educational resource for teaching art history. Right? This is Van Gogh's self-portrait, and this is thousands of others. If you teach English literature, you might turn to Project Gutenberg and use the thousands of classics of English literature that have been digitized and are available to students in a wide variety of formats. Why we need to have new editions of an anthology or, or, of classic English literature is beyond me. Right? There's no read for, need for it when all of this is in the public domain unless you're talking about spending about 70 bucks for a commentary uh, at the start of the book or, or forward. Really not sure how forward it is. It's backwards. But anyway, open textbooks are another obvious one. And I showed you the video from OpenStax. And these are some of the textbooks that are available from OpenStax College. And what's interesting about open textbooks is that they're not the same as they were five years ago. They've really, really changed. So I would challenge you to look at any of the open textbooks from OpenStax College, for example, and distinguish between them and any offering from Pearson or McGraw-Hill or Nelson, for example. They hardcover, glossy, very, very high quality. They have a very large budget, uh, and they really use that. And it comes with all of the resources that faculty want. You want PowerPoint slides? They've got them. You want a test bank? They've got them. You want adaptive learning platforms? They've got them. Whether or not you trust their efficacy, they've got them. Right? So it's not the same. It's not just a sort of a wall of text, which would have been the case five years ago, that's not particularly engaging or doesn't provide the support that faculty need. Um, and of course, uh, this is not a niche issue anymore. OpenStax has achieved a fair degree of penetration. In the United States, OpenStax books are now adopted at one out of every five degree granting institutions. This is not a niche issue. This is moving into the mainstream, surely, steadily. right? In Canada, well, actually, I'll, before I talk about Canada, I'll talk about Minnesota. There's the o Open Textbook Library, which is based at the University of Minnesota, a large R1 institution. And they're sort of an aggregator where they pull together uh, smaller repositories. They invite faculty reviews. And if you want to read what peers in your discipline have thought about a particular book, you can read these reviews openly, the strengths, the weaknesses, very detailed rubrics of those reviews. I would encourage you to visit this. And of course, as I was going to say, in, in Canada, we have started certainly with the BC Open Textbook Project. So the Ministry of Advanced Education about three years ago provided about a million dollars uh, to fund the development or adaptation of textbooks for the 40 highest enrolled undergraduate courses in BC. 
which again is pretty much the same in any jurisdiction. You're talking about the large, uh, typically survey courses, but first and second year we're typically talking about. Uh, and they've done it. They received more funding a little while later to provide uh, textbooks for trades and te uh, technology uh, based subjects. Uh, and at this point, even though they received funding for about 60 books, they have about 140 books in their repository, many of which have been adapted for the Canadian context. So we have Intro to Psych, Canadian edition, for example. Um, uh, you've, you know, research methods in psychology, uh, as you'll see, Canadian edition, which is important because the laws governing research ethics are different in this country from the United States. Um, and much more. There were books that wouldn't even exist that could not be adapted. A colleague of mine, John Belshaw, who works at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, he wrote with funding from BC campus, he wrote a textbook on Canadian pre-Confederation history. Right? And what's wonderful about these books is that they're actually taking advantage of the digital capabilities of the platform. So John, for example, received funding and went around the country interviewing leading historians with expertise in subtopic areas of history. And those video interviews are embedded within the book. The Research Methods book have interactive simulations built in. Right? Again, this thing can come to life. It's incredible. Reviews are available even on the BC Open Textbook website. You can read the faculty reviews, lots of criteria. This will be a bit washed out for you, so I'm going to give you a sense about comprehensiveness, content accuracy, relevance, clarity, consistency, modularity. There's a few more criteria, actually. But you can read these very clearly. And those are the kinds of feedback that are needed as adaptations occur moving forward. This is the one, one of the textbooks that I worked on. So um, as you can see, I'm going to be a little bit biased over here in talking about the textbooks in the BC repository. Um, but what's nice about this is, yes, students can read it online and have that interactive component. But students can download it in a variety of digital formats. This is completely free, completely free. right? But if students are like me and they prefer a, a hard cover, a hard copy, they can get that too. And this is where Simon Fraser University's bookstore has gotten involved. So certainly in the Lower Mainland, uh, they provide the print service, the print-on-demand service with their es espresso machine, printing machine. So students across the, uh, across the province can go online, order a textbook, have it shipped uh, to their home, and they're paying very little money. So a 600-page social psychology textbook that I co-authored, right? If a student wants a hard cover, and I'm talking professionally bound, not some loose leaf binder nonsense, hard, you know, like a nice, nice binding, um, $15, one five. But then we had a problem because the students had to spend money on shipping. And we thought, because shipping a book that, that's, that, that is that heavy costs about 15 bucks, actually. So we thought it's a bit ridiculous to have 100% shipping cost. Uh, and so then we simply had a, a straightforward conversation because there's an interlibrary loan shuttle that moves between our campuses every week. Mm -hmm. So we thought, maybe. And so now that's exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. So students can get it delivered to their home campus for free while paying only 15 bucks for a 600 page book that's bound. Right? It's simple. It's so simple. And this actually opens up a whole new avenue for institutions to provide the printing uh, service and selling those books at the bookstore uh, for students who wish to have that print copy. And it's worth mentioning the bookstore just briefly, because oftentimes when I, when I talk to people about OER, the question is always raised about, well, what about the bookstore? Right? It's like, well, what about the children? <laughs> but, but what's interesting is, if you, does anybody over here work in the bookstore? I'm curious. Talk to people at the bookstore. One of the things I'm going to suggest is if you walk into any bookstore in this country today, fewer than 50% of the items in that store is a book. Right? That's not where they make their money. It's the merchandise. What's interesting as well is how much money they lose on books because they are responsible for reselling the unsold books back to the publishers at the end of the semester. And then when you start to open up new revenue streams within the institution, because the institution has the full Creative Commons copyright to print and sell those books in print format as well. It's a, it's a, different, it, it's a different situation altogether. And the other thing I think worth looking at in your bookstore as well, any bookstore, is that despite the fact that textbook costs have been increasing steadily, more than steadily, rapidly, over the last several decades, the amount that students are spending at campus stores has actually been going down. And that's partly because of all of the reasons you saw before. When they buy used books, when they have shared purchases or rental programs, or they go without, bookstores lose money. And so interestingly enough, bookstores have been innovating for a while. They've been trying to find new ways to innovate. And it was, what, a month ago, um, I was invited to speak at a Campus Stores Canada. It's a bookstore conference in this country. And they wanted to know more about OER and what they can do. So bookstores do not see this particularly as a massive threat. I think they want to understand it. They want to partner with it. 
Ultimately, they want to serve students. So at this point, open textbooks worldwide have saved students $174 million. That's a conservative estimate, by the way, because it's very hard to know when uh, an instructor adopts an open textbook because they don't have to tell you. Right? There's no royalty flowing in. Nobody has any idea. It's only people who tell us that, hey, we've adopted your book for this semester. Then we, oh, OK. And how much was the cost of the book that you displaced? Oh, OK, now we can calculate. So it's a very conservative estimate. And that was in the State of the Commons, Creative Commons report that came out uh, a couple of months ago. In BC, I know conservatively we've saved students more than $1.4 million at this point. And at my institution, I'm happy to say that about a month ago, we were recognized for having crossed 100 course adoptions for open textbooks. The first institution to do that in BC, but certainly there are many others following suit. So <clears throat> I think hopefully at this point, the cost savings is very clear. But I want more than that to be clear. And one of the big barriers for me when I talk about OER and open textbooks in particular is the question of quality. And I've suggested before that there are places like the Open Textbook Library and the BC Open Textbook Project that provide and invite faculty reviews. And they post them transparently. There's no review that's not posted. No worries at all. It makes me feel like I'm more in the classroom, really. <laughs> it's, quite, <laughs> it's very comfortable. <laughs> The trouble happens when, when, when somebody starts sort of looking down at their crotch and smiling, right? <laughs> and in which case, we're dealing with a separate set of issues. But sorry, I couldn't resist that. But let's come to quality. And I think, as early, I suggested that when, when, when publishers come in and talk about the resources that they have and the online platforms that they have, we never ask them about efficacy. We never ask them about data to support their opinions. But we should. So let's talk about quality of traditional publisher materials. And so here are data, again, from a nationally representative survey in the United States, asking faculty what they think of the quality of traditional publishers' resources. Okay? Uh, the green portion, about 35 almost percent, say that they really don't have an opinion. Okay? But if you look at the rest, about 16 percent say it's excellent. Another 36 percent say it's good. Uh, and if you put those two together, let's say about 51 percent say it's good or excellent, so favorable rating. That makes sense. But if you knock out the ones that don't have an opinion, that's really an 80% approval rating. Does that make sense at all? So the 51% off the 65, that's about 80%. Say it's good or excellent. So now, now that we have the control group, now let's look at OER. First thing you'll notice, nobody knows what the hell you're talking about when you say OER. <laughs> what is OER? I have no idea what you mean. So 60% are unfamiliar with the term. And that's the biggest barrier at this point is simple awareness of that existence. But if you look at the people who do know, who are familiar with it, 6% say it's excellent, 25% say it's good. And when you put that together, that's 75%. That's kind of interesting. And then research we did in BC last year, major survey of BC faculty, we found that when you compare instructors who are familiar and unfamiliar with OER, you see that those who are familiar, those who have adopted OER, rate the quality of open educational resources as significantly higher than those who haven't. Again, suggesting that familiarity is something that makes a huge difference. People believe that if it's free, how good can it be? That's a pervasive belief. But what they fail to understand is free to students does not mean free to produce. And there's a lot of money that's poured into this. Over the last 10 years alone, the Hewlett Foundation has funded open ed to the tune of $140 million. It's not free to produce by any means. It's a different system. Faculty don't receive royalties. They get paid up front instead. It's a very different model. So quality is a bit of a misnomer, a bit of a myth. Um, and then, of course, when you ask students, uh, these are data from a couple of different instructors' students at my institution who adopted open textbooks. At the end of the semester, they asked their students, um, what did you think of the quality? And you might think, you know, what do students know about quality? But what students think actually matters as well. So if instructors think it's good, students actually think that it's pretty good as well. They like other things. They like the convenience. They like the access. They like the portability. They like the fact that they can have a hard copy at home, read it on their iPhone on the way into school, tablet, laptop. It doesn't matter. Any device, all the time. They have immediate access. They don't have to wait three weeks for their student loan to come in. They have permanent access. They don't have to resell it. And they have portable access. They like that. Right? Cost savings, of course. Now, this is just, you know, like, do you like unicorns? Everyone's going to say yes. You know, like, <laughs> yes, the cost savings are, matter to me. 
But we also asked them at the end of the semester, you know, now that you've used this open textbook for four months, how do you feel now? Would you have preferred at the start of the semester to actually spend money to buy a Pearson, McGraw-Hill, whatever offering instead? And overwhelmingly, uh, they, I'll come back to that, overwhelmingly, they're saying no. And what would those books have cost? Right? What is the average cost of books for your other courses, which do not adopt open textbooks? And it is typically around $150 on average. Some much higher, some much lower. It varies quite a bit by discipline, of course. But this is why the U of A as well suggests that students um, budget $1,200 a year for textbooks. It's fitting, isn't it, that this graph resembles somebody sticking out their middle finger? I think. Anyway. And then when we look at the comments that students leave us, right? these are confidential online surveys. Students have no no incentive to lie. We don't know who they are. What was your experience like? And look at the comments. Some of them talk about the convenience again. So a lot of them talk about the cost savings. Some of them talk about the accessibility and convenience. But the one that I've blown up in the middle matters the most to me because it's exactly the problem I'm trying to address with, adoption, with adopting open textbooks. Right? I would have walked away with a C. Now I might actually get an A minus. How many of our students are falling into that category? And if the choice is between rent and textbooks, groceries and textbooks, it's not a choice. Simon Fraser's student association at the start of this semester, 60 days ago, had a campaign where they asked students, what would you have bought? What could you have paid for if you hadn't bought textbooks for this semester? And an astonishing number of them listed groceries, bus passes, things like this. This is not a choice we should be forcing our students to make. So at this point, there are 13 peer-reviewed studies that have been published in, in the literature to look at the efficacy and impact on educational outcomes. So let's look at this from the point of view of data. And what's extraordinary is that every single one of those 13 studies says exactly the same thing. In most cases, they find no difference whatsoever in the course performance of those adopt with using open textbooks versus traditional textbooks. And in the few cases where there is a difference, those using OER outperform those with traditional textbooks. So if you look at these 13 studies overall, we're talking about an aggregated sample of over 65,000 students. I'll briefly share two of these studies with you. This one, which was published last year, is one of the most robust and largest studies of its kind. More than 16,000 students in this study alone across 10 different institutions. And it's quasi-experimental, so they're assigning sections, not students, of course. But you, when, you make, when you want to make sure that the groups are equivalent to begin with, they used a technique called propensity score matching. So they're essentially collecting data on a series of 10 covariates, if this makes sense to you. They want to make sure that the groups are not different at the start of the semester. And then it, the difference between the groups is just down to the book. Uh, and what they found was that OER students had lower withdrawal rates. They were more likely to pass the course with a C minus or better, which makes it an effective prerequisite in those institutions. Um, and they perform better, higher course grades. And this sounds fantastic, but I want you to recognize as well the tension, the potential tension between these. Because when you have a lower withdrawal rate, the students who normally would have dropped out of your course, if they're still with you, right, those are not representative of everybody. And if they're still with you and then your course outperforms another course, another section with the traditional textbooks, that's even more impressive. And what is more, you get a sense of where, that's co where those cost savings are being channeled. Because students open in, uh, enrolled in OER courses take significantly more courses the same semester and significantly more courses the subsequent semester as well. It's incredible. Very robust study. Now, 12, or sorry, actually, yeah, but uh, all of the 13 that have been published so far uh, have been conducted within the US. And again, you might wonder, ours is a different context. Tuition is significantly lower in this country, of course. Therefore, the ratio of cost materials to tuition is significantly higher. So would it generalize? And we found that it did. So this is a study that I'm writing up right now. We just presented it at the Open Ed Conference in November in Vancouver. And what we found was across multiple instructors, multiple exams, there was virtually no difference uh, in the students using the open textbooks and the traditional textbooks. There are three bars over here because we broke down the open textbooks even further into students using the print version of the open textbook and using the digital version of the open textbook because we didn't want to conflate the delivery format with the nature of open. So no difference over there at all. The one case where there was a difference was the first exam. This is across multiple instructors where the traditional textbook students significantly perform significantly worse 
and students with OER. And to me, again, I don't know definitively what's driving that. I'm going to guess that's access. These are the students who are waiting several weeks to buy their books, whether it's for student loans or something else. I don't think there's something especially magical about open textbooks. I think it's just access. That's all it is. And that's the power of access. Right? But it does generalize to the Canadian context. And so David Wiley, who's one of the fathers of open education, has developed this rubric, which I really quite like. Right? Mad, glad, sad, rad. And let me explain. So on the y-axis over here, you have cost to students, which should go from zero to probably $400 at this point. But anyway, zero cost to a lot. Uh, and the x-axis over here, you've got the proportion of students completing the course with a C or better. Again, using it as a prerequisite or being able to take it and move further in, a, in the discipline. And the two that are grayed out are grayed out because they're not really interesting. Right? They're not surprising. So if a student doesn't spend money, doesn't buy the books, and they do badly, right, that's sad. But that's not surprising. If student spends the money, spends the $200 or whatever it is, and does well, well, they're glad. But that's not surprising. Right? But the other two are much more interesting. So at Mercy College in the United States, they I'm going to give you an example because this is a published study that you can look up. Um, math courses, where they used a, publisher's a traditional publisher's textbook with a platform called, what was it called? My Math Lab, I think it is. $170 plus whatever, you know, uh, taxes. Uh, and what they found was that just under 50% of their students passed the course with a C or better. Okay? That's control. That's kind of mad. Oh, it should make you mad. So if you spend the money and you don't do that well, or not that many of your students do well, they switch to OER. Open textbook, and they also used an online learning platform called My Open Math which is open, students had to spend a little bit of money, five bucks instead of 100 bucks, for, or $170 for this. And as soon as they switched, 62% of their students passed the course with a C or better. Right? And that's the difference between getting mad and looking at a situation that is pretty rad. I think you'll agree. Right? It's a useful rubric, and I would encourage you to use it in many different places. I think it has wide applicability. So when it comes to OER and open textbooks in particular at this point, I really do think we have a win-win-win situation. It's a big win for students, obviously in terms of the cost savings, but a lot more. It's the access and the accessibility. It's the portability, immediate, permanent access. And of course, the question is asked about at the Open Ed Conference, somebody uh, stuck up their hand in, in, the, in the middle of my presentation and said, so do you have any evidence that, that adopting open textbooks is not harming students? I think we're very far from not harming students. Right? Open textbooks help students. And I'm going to suggest that if there's, even if there's no difference in course outcomes, which there usually is no difference, requiring students to spend two, $300 on a book, that's harm if there's no difference in outcomes. That's what I'm going to suggest. But it's a big win for instructors. And I think this is what I'm really interested in from a pedagogical innovation point of view. Right? This ability to adapt resources and, and customize them to your local context, local examples, local relatables, local statistics. Imagine embedding your assignments within the readings and scaffolding your students' assignments as they're moving through the readings, customizing it, harnessing students in terms of creating and, and adapting and revising these materials. This is what's exciting to me. And then, of course, for institutions, it's very straightforward. In every case where they have looked at this, enrollment has been boosted. So, there's different ways in which institutions have been doing this. In some cases, when students register for courses, they have a new checkbox, identify open textbook sections. You can see the registration pressure going there. Uh, in some cases, institutions have gone a, a lot further, where they've developed entire programs that are based on open textbooks. They call them textbook Z programs in, in the United States. And you see massive re, uh, pressure on enrollment over there. Retention and completion as well. Students are more likely to be retained by an institution that is adopting open textbooks. And they are more likely to complete sooner. As I, as I showed you earlier, they take more courses the same in subsequent semesters as well. So this is me now, a bit younger perhaps. But <laughs> I don't always assign a textbook. And I'm betting that many of the faculty I work with don't either. Right? We all teach upper level classes for which they're teaching a niche topic. There is no textbook. Or we put together readings and chapters. We're used to doing that. But when I do, I certainly prefer that it be open. It's no question. And as I said, there's institutions that are taking this a lot further. We can point to Alberta. So of course, you guys have a terrific program right now 
where faculty who are interested in reviewing books can do so and can get paid for doing so. We're really interested in those reviews and those reviews are being shared across our provinces. BC, Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan have, a, have memoranda of understanding where we're sharing our resources, sharing our open textbooks, and sharing the development and review process as well. So we have this. We have an institution and series of institutions that are looking to take this forward. Faculty can apply, or institutions can apply to what? Up to $10,000, I think, with this program to sponsor a transition to an open textbook, adoption pilots. There is support. The problem right now is more awareness. And as I said, institutions that are taking this much more seriously are benefiting tremendously. This is, an, this is the example of Tidewater Community College, which is in the United States, where they built a two-year degree program in business based entirely on open textbooks. Um, they call it a Textbook Z program. There's lots of uh, organizations, philanthropic organizations, that would support these kinds of initiatives. And they saw massive increases uh, in enrollment, but also in terms of graduation rates. But so far, I think I've still been talking about what I didn't want to spend that much time talking about, which are the resources. And it's very easy to talk about the resources because they're tangible. You know, faculty, staff, everyone understands what a textbook is. But when you start talking more abstractly about teaching and learning practices, it gets a little more difficult. But I'm going to start going there now. Because I'm going to suggest we have another problem. Right? Textbook cost is one problem. Here's another problem. Whether we like it or not, what students learn and how students learn is often driven by the nature of our assessments. And of course, testing is ubiquitous. Multiple choice testing is ubiquitous. And if you boil it down to its lowest common denominator, proliferation, right? Fact-based multiple choice questions taken directly from a publisher supplied test bank. This somehow qualifies as pedagogy. But we do more, right? We have article summaries and lab reports and oral presentations and research essays. And yes, they can write research essays. But I'm going to suggest that we have an opportunity here. Because let's say, best case situation, you assign a research essay as a faculty member. It's probably the student's 17th research essay in the course of their degree. And they'll spend hours working on it. Right? And they'll hand it to you. One person will ever look at their work, which seems a little sad. And then you spend a significant amount of time providing them with you know, feedback. You think about it painstakingly, right? How can I frame this? How can I phrase this so that it comes across as kind but still helpful? And we, we pour so much energy into this. What proportion of our students even bother to pick up the essay, right? And of that proportion of students that picks up the essay, <laughs> what proportion are bothering to read the feedback? If 10% of your students are picking up the essay that you've marked and provided them with formative feedback on, and if 10% of those students are you know, reading the feedback as opposed to looking at the grade and moving on, I'm going to suggest you combine the hours that students spend for one person and the hours that we spend providing feedback for basically nobody. And we've got, this is sucking energy out of the world. <laughs> this is, it's just, it's a waste of human potential is what I'm going to suggest. Certainly, I mean, I'm being a little bit dramatic over here. <laughs> but I want to provide you with some examples of where I think this becomes really, really interesting for open education. Right? One of the best examples I have is what's called ChemWiki, or in fact now STEMWiki. So this is based at the University of California at Davis, where Delmar Larson and other faculty have been doing this for years. So imagine as course assignments, students writing, updating, revising, improving, wiki articles related to a variety of STEM topics, not just chemistry. It started in chemistry. And now they're expanding beyond, expanding beyond STEM disciplines as well. But unlike Wikipedia, which I think we'll all admit, aside from ratemyprof.com, Wikipedia is the other dark corner of the internet. Right? Right? We worry about Wikipedia. And many faculty forbid their students from citing articles in Wikipedia because of unreliability and all of that. This is not Wikipedia. So imagine what junior students write and update and revise is vetted and approved and updated and revised by senior students. And your senior students work is vetted and revised and approved by graduate students. And graduate students work is vetted and approved and revised by faculty. And it's when multiple faculty in this international board of faculty overseers approve it, that's when it goes live to STEM Wiki. So imagine Wikipedia with control, Wikipedia with reliability, right? 
This is what STEMWiki is. STEMWiki has been built by students, students' assignments over years. STEMWiki is the most visited chemistry website in the world, built by students, right? Talk about meaningful work. And it's, it's, a, it's a different situation when students know that their work is not going to be seen by just the instructor, but that the student's work is going to be public. So this is about harnessing students' energy, potential, and even their creativity, and repurposing it to have them produce resources for the commons. There are dozens of institutions that suck out customized versions of textbooks from STEM Wiki. You can see these over here. And it's a living document, right? So it's not edition. This continually updates. You don't have to wait three years for some new development to be incorporated. And for faculty who are interested, they even provide logins so that you can, your students log in and you can, you can get wonderful analytics. Delmar, for example, found early on that when he had a major midterm exam and a major final exam, he was able to see what proportion of his students were accessing 75% or more of their readings for that exam for the first time 24 hours before the exam. He was able to identify the crammers by virtue of these learning analytics through the use of ChemWiki. And he was able to use that information and modify the course design to go into flatter, more frequent assessments, which is better for many things. It's better for the spacing effect, for the testing effect, for distributed learning, for a number of things. So this is where it's not just OER, this is open pedagogy. And this is how intimately our philosophy of teaching is intertwined with the use of teaching and learning resources. I love ChemWiki. And of course, we can talk about Wikipedia as well. Because as much as Wikipedia is unreliable, it doesn't mean we just moan about it for the rest of our lives. We can actually address the problem. So in my discipline, psychology, we have a, a couple of major disciplinary bodies. Uh, one of them is called APS, or the Association for Psychological Science. And APS partnered with Wikipedia years ago. Why? Because there are a lot of psychology articles. They're viewed quite a lot. Barely two thirds of them have gone through Wikipedia's version of peer assessment, which is not what faculty would consider to be peer assessment. And barely 9% of those have achieved good article status. So if you're frightened about Wikipedia, you have very good reason to be frightened about Wikipedia. But again, not moaning about the problem. Thousands of instructors across the world now participate in this Wikipedia initiative, where their class assignments, their students' assignments, is finding articles related to a topic, improving them. Whether it's updating them, providing links, providing references, adding citations, providing images, writing articles where there are none, improving articles that are out of date, editing articles that are simply wrong, flagging errors where you find them. This is happening wholesale. And if you think this is hard to manage, I could maybe do this in my class of 35 students at Kwantlen. That's our cap in the, in the classroom. No. Steve Jordans, my friend at the University of Toronto, teaches an introductory psychology class. Size, 1,200 students each section. Picture that. And if they do this assignment, which they do, it can be done anywhere. It's incredible. And you think of all the disciplines where this is happening. It's not just psychology. This is just some of the disciplines where instructors are doing this, where they're having their students practice public scholarship, practice open pedagogy. Right? It's quite incredible. And the learning outcomes are the same and better. Students can achieve much deeper understanding of the topic, but they also get experience with things like uh, evaluating, defending credibility of sources, collaborating, peer assessment, digital literacy. Again, that nonsense about digital natives. Students need help. And there are campus ambas ambassadors from Wikipedia that help with all of this. There's a lot that can be done. And finally, uh, keeping in mind that the majority of my students in psychology are not going to go on to graduate school in psychology. But here's a skill that I want all of them to have. It's a difficult skill to develop, being able to communicate complex scientific ideas to a lay audience. And to be able to come out of the course with what's effectively an electronic portfolio of your academic work, it's incredible. This is an example of open pedagogy. And students are not frightened of this at all, right? Note where that student's from, by the way, Augustana. My favorite part about writing from Wikipedia was knowing that the information presented is valuable to someone. This builds efficacy, it builds purpose. And students, in my experience, whenever I've practiced open pedagogy, pour a lot more energy into their work than they would otherwise. Right? This pride. This is a student at U of T talking about synthesizing articles that are hidden behind paywalls and summarizing that research and providing it to the public. And I could talk about the open access issue as well. It's equally ludicrous, isn't it? Public funding, tri-council, let's say, funding. Supplement that with generous dollops of volunteer work in the form of peer review by faculty equals record profits for Elsevier. 
and the public who paid for the research have to pay $45.95 to access an article that I wrote. It's completely ridiculous. Right? And the students taking pleasure in, 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 in blasting apart that particular paywall. And there's a lot more. You don't have to read all of these. But it's the sense of meaning and purpose. Students are not frightened of these assignments. Overwhelmingly, in my experience, they are not. And you can always provide alternative assignments. But to me, one wonderful solution to the question of the sustainability of open educational resources, when we move beyond philanthropic organizations, when we move beyond government, and when we move beyond in universities, there are lots of universities that fund the development of OER. To me, the most exciting model for the sustainability of open educational resources are students, and thinking about students as creators, and harnessing that power, that potential in the classroom. Right? That's humbling. Where a paper will most likely be read by only one uh, single professor, these edits are on the web for all to see. And that's true for my work as well. Right? A paper that I published in December in a peer-reviewed journal, if I had to guess how many people are actually going to download and read that paper, I'm going to guess fewer than 50 people over the next five years. Right? And I may be optimistic even with that. This is the reality of the peer review publishing, publish or perish mentality that we have. This is the system. So an article that a student of mine wrote for Wikipedia or edited in Wikipedia will be read by thousands of people more than, more than will ever read my work. That's kind of humbling. Right? But that's the scholarship I want to prepare them for. So at this point, a lot of students have participated in these kinds of assignments. A lot of articles have been created. And when you ask instructors at the end of the semester, would you do this again? Because instructors have to be taught how to do these assignments as well. Almost all of them say yes. And if you're interested in this, go to the Wikipedia Foundation's website, where there are a suite of resources for faculty, training faculty about how do you do this kind of assignment. There's resources to help them and sort of step-by-step -step guides. Same thing for students. There's guides, there's platforms. There's millions of people doing this stuff. So you don't have to reinvent any wheels. But here's one, I mean, here's another example. This is another organization uh, that produces OER. It's called the NOBA Project, although this is specific to psychology. And I love the NOBA Project partially because I work with them. Um, but they have a very different model. Instead of going to a, a, an author or a group of authors to write a textbook for intro psychology, they went to the unquestionably the leading experts in the subtopic areas of psychology. And they got them each to write these short 10-page modules, which are effectively subsections of chapters. And they provide these, again, CC licensed, on a customizable drag and drop platform online with a suite of ancillary resources, all the resources you would want and more. But this is not what I'm talking about over here. They also have a, a video competition. So every year, they've had, for a few years now, a student video competition, where they invite students to produce two to three minute videos to provide an overview of a psychological theory or concept in an engaging and creative fashion. Thousands of submissions every year. Right? And, and you know, of course, the, the winners last year, the first prize was taken by these two students in Canada at Simon Fraser University. They won $6,000 US which is, what, like 50,000 Canadian at this point. <laughs> Second prize was Ohio State. Third prize, prize was shared between students in India and students at my institution, Kwantlen. Because we've been talking about this stuff for so long in BC. There's more institutions doing it. But again, think about this. The meaning, the pride, the sense of value. This video, produced by students, is now being used by instructors across the world to teach the science of persuasion. That's the power of this stuff. Right? It's incredible. It's beautiful. And more, students in, students in social psychology, for example, we get them now to, 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 to take their budding expertise in, in the discipline and share that with the community. Write an op-ed, submit it for publication, share your expertise with the community, address a social issue, right? give it away. People have a sense that when you give away what you know, it's being taken away from you. But it's not. Right? It's like when we teach in the classroom. It's beautiful. And again, for a student to leave a class, an undergraduate student, second year student, with an op-ed publication, this is powerful. This is the kind of stuff that makes a huge difference for employers who are looking for those transferable skills. A massive difference. Right? And so I want to come back to thinking about assessments as vehicles. Right? And I think that's what they are. The way in which we design our course, yes, but specifically the assessments, they do drive learning. But assessments are vehicles, and they're designed to transport students from where they are now to where we hope they will get. But I'm going to suggest that if we stick with what has been traditionally the case, over-reliance on multiple choice testing, for example, right? it, it is a bit like having an aircraft and, and choosing to drive it down the highway. 
It's a little weird. I mean, you can do it. You're going to get some side eye. You know, people are going to look at you funny. I will look at you funny. Right? But it's capable of so much more. And that's the point. Approaching the course design and the assessment design as well from the perspective of how can we create? How can we move beyond? How can, how can we play with the construction and sharing of knowledge? So this is open pedagogy. And if all this talk of open educational resources and open pedagogy sounds vaguely familiar, it may be because the open science movement has been gaining great steam. Right? A lot of this is happening because of the need to enhance the replicability of disciplines in some cases, like psychology, uh, a need also to prevent fabrication of data and provide more accountability and transparency. There's a drive for, for researchers to openly share their hypotheses and their data analysis plan before they collect the data. This is clean, this is transparent, and we don't have uh, fraudulent data practices. And there are major journals that are now providing digital badges to scholars who are sharing their hypotheses before they collect the data. And then, of course, you actually, uh, sorry, you design your study, your questionnaires, your surveys, whatever instruments you're using, and there's a drive to share those instruments openly, and there are badges for doing that. Again, this enhances the replicability of your science if you're sharing your methods openly. Then you collect the data, and now there's a big drive to share data openly as well. Variety of reasons, whether it's wanting to prevent data fraud or whether it's enhancing the process of cumulative science. These are all important steps. This is all open science, right? Over, over, overwhelmingly, people are moving away from exorbitantly priced statistical packages like SPSS, which now are exorbitant, to open source st statistical software like R or um, JASP, for example. And then, of course, open peer review. There are major journals that are moving away from the double blind process to where your name is attached to the comments that you provide. It doesn't degrade the quality of the, rev or the review. It makes the comments a little more kinder. But a number of studies have looked at the impact on peer review, and it does not degrade the quality of review. And then, of course, open access publishing. And I'm not talking about the predatory open access journals over here. And I'm, to some degree, not even talking about um, the, the traditional journals that double dip by, by asking authors for article processing fees. Prov you know, pay me $3,000, and then you can have your article be open access. I'm talking about fully open access journals, or what's called platinum open access as well. And plus, the Pub Public Library of Science is a good e example of a major journal that, that does this quite a lot. This is all open science, right? And it's incredible to me that whether you look at it from the point of view of open educational resources and the cost savings and the social justice argument and the pedagogical case and the educational outcomes case, whether you look at it in terms of open pedagogy and the potential we have to repurpose our students' energy and potential, or whether you look at it from open science practices or open access publishing, remember this, right? The opposite of open is not closed. The opposite of open is broken. And that's what all of this is going towards. These are all largely obvious problems that we've been dealing with for some time. And I'm glad that the Tri-Council, not that long ago, put out a policy that mandates that publicly funded research in this country must be in an open access repository after 12 months. Right? I'm glad that we're seeing that kind of language. But I would like to see us move to the point where open does become the default, where we first look to see if there are open textbooks available for our courses before we automatically go with Pearson, for example. And I don't mean that as a slight against publishers, but I think we need the process to be much more transparent. OER is not something people know about. There's no sales team, there's no marketing team, there's nobody knocking on your door, there's nobody sponsoring free lunches, nothing happening. Right? This is organic, and it's largely grassroots. Now we have more support. So in BC, for example, we have grants that we can apply for. In Alberta, we have grants we can apply for. And we're seeing more and more adopters. We're seeing more and more adapters and more and more creators, students as creators as well. So from my perspective, an institution like this has a big decision in front of them. There is a vacuum of leadership, certainly in this province, when it comes to open ed resources. Lots of people playing with it, lots of people who are sort of dabbling with it, pockets of innovation, but no institution has championed it yet in a big way. Right? And I think this, from my perspective, where, what we're seeing in the States, what we're seeing outside of the States and within Canada, this is a massive, massive wave that's challenging 
the assumptions that we make governing teaching and learning, the assumptions that all students have access to the resources when they don't, the assumption that, uh, uh, that for example, science should be conducted in a closed platform or publishing should be traditional only. These are assumptions that are starting to be questioned. And the question for me is whether the U of A wants to be at the crest of that wave or whether it wants to follow in its wake. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.